I want to start off by asking you, how many of you are familiar with Lint by a show of hands? Like when I say familiar, you kind of know what it is. You maybe have kind of sort of participated in it a little. Okay. So if I look up Lint in the dictionary, this is the official Merriam-Webster definition of the word Lent. Lent is the period preceding Easter that in the Christian church is devoted to fasting, abstinence, and penance in commemoration of Christ's fasting in the wilderness. In the Western church, it runs from Ash Wednesday to Holy Saturday, and so includes 40 weekdays. By the way, the 40 days do not count Sundays because every Sunday in the early church was a celebration of Jesus' resurrection. So that's why Lent doesn't count Sundays. Now, I never grew up practicing Lent. I grew up in a good Southern Baptist church. You know, nothing wrong with it, but in Southern Baptist churches, Lent and Ash Wednesday and, uh, you know, Monday, Thursday and all these other, you know, we had Good Friday and Easter. Okay? Yeah. We didn't have all this other stuff. I didn't really, I mean, I didn't, I didn't understand Lent. I didn't understand Ash Wednesday. Um... You know, I knew a little bit as I got into high school about Mardi Gras because it was like, yeah, I want to be in New Orleans then, you know. But as a matter of fact, as I thought about this, I thought I never really had any exposure to Lent until I was in graduate school at seminary. And one of the professors, one of the classes I, I took, uh, began to kind of educate us on what Lent was and what the, what the church calendar was. But it really wasn't until I came to Salem and worked with Pastor Dale, that I really began to understand Lent. Because Pastor Dale was the first Baptist pastor that I had ever served under that had an Ash Wednesday service. He was the first one that ever really spoke on Lent and taught on Lent. And because of that, I really began to understand Lent and began to incorporate it into my life. And I really began to understand what Ash Wednesday was. I'd never been to an Ash Wednesday service until Pastor Dale led one here. Just hadn't been to one. Didn't grow up in that setting. Maybe you were like me. Maybe you are like me. When I was in my teen years. You're kind of familiar with Lent, but not really familiar with it. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe even some of your friends participate in it. You may have some friends that will be walking around with a black smudge on their forehead this evening because they've been to an Ash Wednesday service. But you really don't know all the ins and outs of it. And you really don't understand why people observe it at all. And you don't really get why it's 40 days. And you don't understand the significance of what it's all about. You see, most people, when they hear the word Lent, they think of two things. They, they think about seeing people on Ash Wednesday with a black smudge on their forehead. And they think about it being a season where you give up something. The number of times that I have had people tell me, I'm going to give up sugar for Lent, or I'm going to give up chocolate for Lent, or I'm going to give up fast food for Lent, and then I'll be really healthy. Well, that's not what Lent is about. You can give up cheeseburgers without having to do Lent, okay? Lent is a, is a season of getting us ready to celebrate Easter. It's preparing us for Easter. So tonight, I thought, what would I speak on tonight with it being Ash Wednesday? And would we have a typical, would I try to do an Ash Wednesday service up here or something similar to that? And I thought, well, you know, why not spend a few minutes just talking about Lent? What Lent is, why people observe Lent, why it's even on the Christian calendar, and then more importantly, how can Lent change our celebration of Easter, your celebration of Easter? How can Lent ultimately even change your relationship with Jesus? First, I want you to understand Lent is not something new. Believe it or not, a man named Irenaeus, who was born in 130 AD. So for those of you that are calendar challenged, that's 130 years after Christ died. Was part of the early Christian church. And he wrote in his writings about a period of fasting... This sounds a lot like Lent. He wrote about the church going through a period of fasting and preparation of celebrating Jesus' resurrection. 
Now, it wasn't until 325 A.D. that a bunch of Christian leaders got together at this place called the Nicene Council, and I, that's a name that you all will probably never remember, but this big meeting of Christian leaders, and at this meeting, they established a lot of things for the early Christian church. But the two big things that came out of that meeting, one, they established Easter as a Christian holiday, and where it would fall on the calendar. Have you ever noticed... Easter is never on the same day. Christmas is always December 25th, no matter what day of the week it is. Easter is always on Sunday. And it's never the same date from one year to the next. So this council establishes Easter as a Christian holiday. And then they discuss a 40-day period leading up to Easter called Lent, that would be a time of fasting and a time of preparation for Easter. So you can see that Lent's been around a long time. Because for those of you that are mathematically challenged, we're in 2022 AD. So Lent has been around roughly, you know, 1,700 years. If you go back to 325. If you go back to 130, it's been around, you know, almost 2,000 years. So it's certainly not something new. And when it initially started, it started as a very set, a set, very strong, strict set of rules about fasting and prayer that were all designed to help Christians repent of their sins and remove things from their lives that distracted them from their relationship with Jesus. It was very, uh, very hard in the early years to really stay true and devout to Lent and the period of Lent. Now over time, over several hundred years, Lent has developed and taken on a new shape along with everything else in the rest of the world. And it's no lo it no longer involves a strict set of rules about how the 40 days should be conducted and what you should do each day. See, Lent is really now about a time where we give something up when we fast from something so that we can focus on Jesus instead of what we're giving up. You see, Lent is not about giving up chocolate so that you can lose weight. Or giving up soft drinks so that you can be a healthier person. Lent is, when you give up something like that, like for me, I'm, I'm a caffeine junkie, okay? That question about caffeine, coffee or soda, I, I could easily give one or the other up, but I gotta have, whatever one I give up, I gotta have the other one. You know, if I, if I, if I gave up soda, no problem. I, w I wouldn't miss diet soft drinks for love or money. But I also couldn't give up coffee at the same time. My bigger sacrifice would be giving up caffeine. And if I gave up caffeine, nobody would want to be around me after about three days. I would not be a pleasant person. But the idea is that you would give up something that, that has a significant part of your life that's, that's keeping you from growing closer to Christ is keeping you from moving forward in your relationship and spending more time with Jesus. And that when you gave that thing up, whenever you wanted that thing, whenever you would long for that or desire to have that, you would instead use that time to focus on Jesus and what he had done for you. So there's a little bit about what Lent is. So why do people observe Lent? Why do, why do we celebrate it? Why is it even on the calendar? Well, like I said, Lent is a season that leads up to Easter. And Easter is the Super Bowl of the church, okay? A lot of people think Christmas is the big time in the, in the, Christ, in the Christian calendar. It pales in comparison to Easter. Easter is when Jesus showed up and showed off. It's when he came back to life. Yeah, a baby being born and placed in a manger, that's a big deal. But it pales in comparison to a man loving you so much that he'd die on a cross for you and three days later he walked out of the grave. Because last time I checked, ain't nobody walking out of those graves across the parking lot, okay? That's a big deal. Easter is a huge celebration of the fact that Jesus rose from the grave, that he defeated sin and death, and that he announced to the world that he is king, that he can overcome everything. And the celebration of Easter is really, one might even say, it's the heart of Christianity. It is what Christianity is all about. So, Lent 
did not just get thrown in before Easter for no reason at all. Lent got placed before Easter so that it would become a time of preparation for Christians to get ready to celebrate the biggest event in Christian history. The event that really makes us all Christians to begin with. Lent is, is about preparing those who observe it to celebrate Jesus at Easter time by reminding us of how much we need Jesus. It's a season where we recognize our weakness and we recognize our sin and we recognize our shortcomings and we fast or give up things as a sign of our humility and dependence on Jesus to save us. If you've got a Bible with you tonight or you're looking it up on an app, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 7 through 10. Uh, and verse 7 actually picks up the middle of a sentence, but it's the best place I can see to pick this up. Um, it's chapter 12, start with verse 7, 2 Corinthians. Paul says, Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness. And in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then... I am strong. Paul, the guy who wrote all this, is writing about how he had been given a quote-unquote thorn in his flesh. Now, the best way I can think about this is, you ever got a rock in your shoe? Mm -hmm. yes. Just the other day, I came out of the shower, I stepped on something in my bedroom floor, it got stuck to the bottom of my foot, I put my sock on, I didn't make it to the car. Before I, I mean, I like sitting out, leaning against the front door of my car, taking my sock and shoe off. Because whatever is inside my sock is such an annoying pain in the neck that I don't even want to think about it being in my foot any longer. So when I think about Paul having a thorn in the flesh, that's kind of what I'm thinking about here. Is getting that, uh, that rock in your shoe. Not a big rock, just something annoying enough for you to know that it's there. Or you ever get a splinter and you can't get it out and everything you grab or touch from there on hurts? Now, we never find out exactly what this thorn is. But whatever it is, it's clearly a source of weakness for him. It's clearly a struggle for Paul. It's something that's making it hard for him to be the Christian that he wants to be. And I want you to listen to this carefully. I want you to understand that Paul sees that recognizing my weakness helps me recognize the perfect power and strength of Jesus. That's what Paul is saying. Look back up there at verse 9. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness. So that the power of Christ can work through me. You see, recognizing our weakness helps us recognize the perfect power and strength of Jesus. That's one of the key things about Lent, is that we recognize things that we struggle with as Christians. Areas that we're not getting it right. Things that get in the way of our relationship with Jesus. And we realize that we need to put those aside and focus on growing closer to Jesus and letting Jesus have a bigger part of our lives. And only then, only through the perfect power and strength of Jesus can we really become the Christian that he wants us to. See, we can't get it right on our own. The rock in our shoe, it's never going away until we seek help from Christ. Can you imagine how excited you'd be to celebrate Jesus on Easter? If you spent 40 days leading up to Easter being reminded of Jesus' strength and power compared to your weakness. Because Easter is a celebration of his ultimate strength and power. Easter would become a huge celebration in your life. It would become a day that's as big as Christmas. Maybe even bigger. So why 40 days? You see, throughout the Bible, 40 
has special significance. Believe it or not, God has chosen this number to help emphasize times of trouble and hardship. Times of struggle. And you see it over and over in the Bible. For example, in the book of Genesis, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights when God flooded the earth. When Noah built the ark and had all the, you know, all the animals on it. 40 days and 40 nights. Moses, when he was in, on Mount Sinai waiting for God to give him the Ten Commandments, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Goliath taunted Saul's army for 40 days before David arrived to save the day. All times of hardship and trouble. But most importantly, and one that's probably our biggest example of why 40 days exist, Flip your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. I should just say, turn in your phones. I don't think anybody flips in the Bible anymore. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Which is okay, I'm okay with that, because that means all of you are actually looking at the verses. So. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness... To be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights alone. Just before he was tempted by Satan. Now some people, some Bible scholars actually think. That Jesus was fasting alone and in the wilderness. To make himself weak and vulnerable. So that he could really experience temptation. At his weakest most vulnerable point so that he would know what it's like to really be human and to be us I don't necessarily agree with that I just don't Jesus is like there when the world is made he has as much power as God I think he knows what it's like to be tempted and to face temptation I think the reason that he's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights is that Jesus knew that that was a way that he could prepare himself to stand up to temptation. That if he spent 40 days and 40 nights fasting and in solitude and praying to his Father and really focusing on God, That he knew that was exactly what he was going to have to do to be able to stand up to Satan. To be ready to stand up to temptation. To be ready to, to take on whatever Satan was going to throw his way. So you see, practicing Lent for 40 days is a way that we can follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We're preparing ourselves, not just for the celebration of Easter, but how we can become fully devoted followers of Christ as we humble ourselves and as we make sacrifices and as we focus on Him. So I've talked what Lent is. I've told you why we observe Lent, why it's 40 days long. Now I want to get to the meat of the message tonight. I want you to hear how this all changes your life. Where we go from here. You know, as Pastor Dale would see, say, I think it's great to share a lot of knowledge, but it's worthless if I don't put some handles on it for you to be able to carry it out of here. And it's easy to look at Lent and to think that it's old and out of place in our world today. It's easy to think that nobody's going to be able to give up food for 40 days. But I challenge you to see that, that we may need Lent more now than at any other time in history. That we may need a time of 40 days of focusing on Jesus and our relationship with Him than we may have ever needed it. Because our world is full of distractions. It is so easy to get off target. And we all need to take time to focus more on Jesus. On his strength and his love and his forgiveness and his compassion and his grace and how that can be a part of our lives. How we can share that with other people. We need to take the purpose of Lent and find ways that we can practice it today that makes sense to us. Instead of trying to do it the way they did it 2,000 years ago. So as I thought about that, I thought, I want to give you seven ways to practice Lent. 
Seven, because that's another good Bible number. It's all over the Bible. But I'm going to give you four things to give up and three things to take up in place of what you give up. And when you go to small groups, you'll talk even more about this. Maybe the first thing you think about giving up is food. Now, it's, it's probably not realistic that anybody in this room is going to fast for 40 days, okay? Um, many of us are, are not made to do that, okay? But, you could give up one meal a day. Or, you could give up a certain sweet that you love. Or a certain drink that you love. Soft drink, coffee, or tea. And every time you have a craving for that item, you remind yourself why you gave it up. And you ask God to help you grow closer to Him. Now that's probably the easiest thing to do in Lent, is to give up something food related. These others, they're going to get a little tougher. Maybe you give up some screen time. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you live for your social media accounts? You have to have your daily YouTube fix. Or you waste time watching TikToks. Last Thursday night, my son, my 23-year-old son, who was with us on Winter Retreat, many of you know him, he was home for an honest appointment. He couldn't go to bed. He was up till 3 o'clock in the morning watching TikToks. <laughs> and then he was complaining when he was sleeping on the couch and he got woke up at 6.30 in the morning because everybody was up moving around. <laughs> we all laughed. It was Garrett. We all laughed. But... How many of us waste time staring at TikTok? How about your daily video game fix? You, know? you see, none, none of these are necessarily a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with social media. There's nothing wrong with YouTube. There's nothing wrong with TikTok. There's nothing wrong with video games. But if you're honest, these things might distract you in your relationship with Jesus. So what if you took 40 days from Snapchat or TikTok or your favorite video game? What if you said, I'm not going to play this game for the next 40 days? What if you said, I'm not going to post anything and I'm not going to look on social media for the next 40 days? Some of you, you think the world's ending because your snap freaks are going to end. <laughs> but if that sounds impossible... Then start small. I'm going to give up a half an hour a day of whatever it is. And then next week I'm going to move it up, or two days I'm going to move it up to an hour and just gradually build up to it. See what you can work towards in 40 days. Imagine what you can fill your time with. Because here in a moment I'm going to give you some ideas to fill your time with it. The third thing that you could give up this is going to hurt. Oh boy, that is going to hurt. Complaining or negativity? That's going to hurt. Come on. Now you see the cringe. You know, the truth is, a lot of us complain. Who are you looking at? A lot of us complain way more than we probably should. But what if for the next 40 days you made a commitment not to complain or be negative about anything? What if for the next 40 days, the glass was always going to be half full? You were always going to be optimistic. You were always going to have a smile on your face, no matter how bad the world got. Now, I'm going to tell you that if you choose to give up complaining and negativity for Lent, you're probably going to need some accountability for this one. Okay, This one's probably going to be the toughest one to give up so far. So maybe if you decide this is what I'm going to give up for the next 40 days, you're going to ask some friends and family, maybe your small group, to call you out when they hear you complaining or being negative. And then don't get grumpy at them when they do call you out. Don't complain anymore. But as if that's not gotten tough enough, maybe the other thing you give up is that one sin. You know, what is it for you? Porn, lying, gossip. Hooking up with a boyfriend or girlfriend? Drugs? Alcohol? What's the one thing that you know you need to stop doing? What's the one thing that you know is the biggest hindrance in your walk with Jesus? And then you decide to give it up for Lent. And 
you focus on Jesus instead. And you ask Jesus to help you leave it behind after the 40 days. See, I told you the give-ups are just going to get tougher. Food is probably the easiest thing to give up. Screen time, second easiest. Complaining, negativity, that can be a little bit tougher. But that one sin that we've all got hidden in our closet that we don't even want to admit that we have, that might be the toughest thing to give up. Because it's a crutch for us. Now, let's talk about some positive things. I've asked you to give up some things. Let's talk about what you can put in their place, what you could pull into your life in 40 days. You see, sometimes fasting is not so much about giving something up as it's bringing something else in. Maybe you take up prayer. Now, this seems obvious, but most of us are not really in the habit of spending time with God in prayer once a day. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to ask you to do this, but if I ask you to raise your hands, how many of you have prayed once a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, I bet we don't get half the people in this room that honestly say they pray once a day. Spending time with God in prayer will change your life. This isn't about just praying once a day. If you take up prayer, it's about talking to God throughout your day. And if you make this commitment to talk to God every day during Lent, I'm telling you, this will have huge impacts on your relationship with God. When you feel tempted to say something, you pause and ask God to help you give you strength not to say it, to control your tongue. When you feel tempted to commit that one sin that you know you're holding on to, you pray and ask God for strength to walk away from it. You see, this will lead to a huge blessing, and it's going to change your relationship with Jesus forever. But we're not stopping there. Maybe not just taking up prayer. Maybe you say, I'm going to take up the Bible. I bet even fewer of you, if I asked you if you read your Bible every day, would raise your hand. Trust me, I was there not too long ago. Just a few years ago, I struggled to read my Bible every day. Mainly because for me, the Bible is a textbook. And I study it all day at work, so the last thing I want to do is look at it when I'm at home. But I'm telling you, it'll change your life forever if you spend a little bit of time in God's Word every day. And the Bible app that you hear me talk so much about, the free one, you version, it is absolutely chock full of Lent reading plans. And gives you daily reminders to remember to read. But why not as a small group, you make a deal with one another saying, we're going to start a Bible reading plan during the next 40 days of Lent. And every day we're going to read this together. If you don't want to do it as a small group, if you're on Uverse and you send me a friend request, I'll include you in my Bible reading plans. I have, I, huh? I have one. We, I, it's going on constantly. We don't stop. As soon as one plan ends, the next one starts. Yeah. We're like five days away from ending the one we're in right now. And the next one starts the Matthew West one based on his song Broken Things. Um, and I love my favorite part of the whole thing is the talk it over section at the very end I love the comments I love when people say what God's saying in their lives and I always try to put a comment in there every day just because I like to foster the conversation but if you decide that you're going to take up Bible reading and spending time with God's words that's never a bad idea but that'll change your life forever maybe you take up better church attendance most of you don't realize this, but we're here a couple times every week. You can come to church twice a week. What a novel idea, huh? For worship and Bible study and fellowship. Every Sunday morning we have two great worship services that you can pick from. You can't get here by 845, there's one at 11 o'clock. And we have Bible study smack in the middle of it at 10 o'clock. So maybe you make a commitment during Lent that... Church is going to be a priority in your life. And for the next 40 days, you're going to get to church. Maybe that means you have to call somebody to get a ride. You need a ride on a Sunday morning, you call me. I'll figure out a way to get you here. If you want to be at church, I'll get you to church. Even if it means i got to come pick you up at 7.30 in the morning. Maybe it means you challenge your parents to get up and come to church. And be at church on a Sunday morning. So there you have it. 
Seven ideas for Lent that could change your relationship with Jesus forever. As you get ready to go to small groups, you're going to be asked to think about which one or two or three of these that you need to put in your life. That you need to act on. And I challenge each one of you in this room to choose at least one, including the adults in this room, and try it this year for Lent. You know what got me hooked on the Bible app? The pandemic. When I couldn't be around people all the time. Somebody sent me one of those 40-day Lent reading plans, and I thought, well, why not? I've never used the Bible app for anything more than just reading Bible verses in church. I'm not doing anything. I'm sitting at home all day. I'll start reading. And I grabbed a hold of the 40-day reading plan for Lent, and I, I haven't stopped. That was two years ago. I think I've got a streak of like 700 days on the Bible app. It's crazy. But I've gotten so used to it that when I miss it, things feel out of, out of, out of sorts in my life. Whether I read it in the morning before I come to work, or I read it in the afternoon, or I read it at night before I go to bed, every day I find time to read that Bible app, to invest a little bit in God's Word. While Lent has changed a lot over time, and it can look a, it can look a lot of different ways for everyone, the heartbeat of Lent is for all of us to slow down, and to remind ourselves about our weaknesses, and to recognize just how much we need Jesus in our lives. So I wonder, is it too much to ask for all of us to participate in Lent together this year? For all of us to prepare ourselves for Easter? And in the process, become more fully devoted followers of Jesus? Our small groups lend themselves perfectly to a group of people that can help hold you accountable with your decisions for what you want to give up or take up in Lent. And if your small group won't hold you accountable, and you want somebody to hold you accountable, reach out to me. You can call me out, I'll call you out, and we'll have a fun time for 40 days. Let's pray, guys. Father, I thank you so much for today, God. I thank you for a chance just to be here in this place. Father, I pray that you help all of us think about what we need to give up and what we can take up during this season of Lent. We love you. Amen. Okay, guys, we're going to send you out to small groups. I have no middle school leaders, so we're going to have to do some shuffling around tonight. Uh, they're both out, so... Yes, are you waving at me? Uh-huh, I'll You're just going to take the middle schoolers? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're all staying on this floor. There's no need to go downstairs, so... Yeah, because half of your group's not here. Because they're in Portland, Because they had uh, compared us to Chris here in Portland. That are in Portland, Portland. Are you holding? Yeah. Are you trying to go? No, he'll be trying to go. He's trying to go.